So I'm going to start off by asking a couple questions. The first question is, how many people in this room, raise your hand, know that physical activity is good for you? Right? So everybody does. Everyone raises their hand. You have to be living in a cave not to know that, because we're constantly barraged with information about physical activity. Of course, if you were living in a cave, you wouldn't need that information because you'd be more active, right? <laughs> so the second question. So even though you know physical activity is good for you, how many people in this room, raise your hand, struggle at least sometimes to fit it into their lives? So three quarters, maybe more, right? So it's challenging. We have busy lives, and there are a lot of hurdles to physical activity, right? But if we can do it, it can really make a big difference. So the topic uh, that I was asked to talk about today is physical activity and longevity. And the longevity probably caught your attention, because it means long life, right? But there are also elements of wellness and health in there. And I think we'd all like to turn back the clock just a little bit. You know, maybe not all the way to high school, but certainly to the college days here at Stanford. That would be good. And people have been wanting to turn back the clock for centuries, right? So here's a painting from um, the 1500s, the Fountain of Youth. You're carting old women up in, in wagons. They hop into the water. They splash around. They come out the other side. And they're all rejuvenated as young nubile maidens. And they go into the tent. <laughs> So I'm not going to claim that physical activity is the fountain of youth, but right now it's the closest thing that we have. So 85 years old can look very different. It could look like this woman here who's in a wheelchair and dependent on others for most of her acti activities of daily living, or it could look like Josie here out there running a marathon. And if I were to ask you who you'd rather be like at age 85, I have no doubt that you'd pick Josie, right? Out there doing her thing, big smile on her face, living life to the fullest. Now, there are things that may sort of derail you on your trajectory of aging that are out of your control, bad genes, injury, accidents, certain diseases. But there are also a lot of things that you can do in your life to change that trajectory of aging more towards Josie and away from the woman in the wheelchair. We call that healthy aging or successful aging. And physical activity is one of those elements. So on the side here are a list of things that we know are positively impacted by physical activity. And this represents decades of research. We know why they work, we know how they work, and we know that they do work. And so when you put all of these things together, this is what helps change your trajectory more towards Josie. So things in the body, in the brain, uh, in the cells. So cellular aging, physical activity can actually turn back the clock and make your cells functionally younger. And they really add up. So we have this magic pill, right? Physical activity. Most of us have access to it, and in many cases, it can be free. So what's the problem? Well, frequently when I talk about physical activity or exercise, this is the response I get. <laughs> Wah! <laughs> exercise, I thought you said extra fries, right? So probably many of you in this room are exercisers, but a lot of people don't treat physical activity as a very popular way to improve their health. In fact, if you look at the rates of US adults who meet the guidelines for physical activity, it's about 20% for one in five. And the interesting thing about that is that number has been relatively stable over the past 30, 40, 60 years. It's hovered around 20%. And that's in spite of all of this new information we have about how good physical activity is for us. And also, in that same time, we've had increases in obesity and a variety of diseases and comorbidities associated with inactivity, like type 2 diabetes, exponential increases. And those are complex syndromes with a lot of inputs, but we know that physical activity does play a role in that. So if recreationally phys physical activity is about stable, then what's changing? Well, what's changing is life in the modern world. So our baseline is changing. We have engineered physical activity out of our lives. We take escalators and elevators instead of the stairs. We sit in cars for long periods of time. We sit in front of screens for hours, whether it's a computer, a TV, an iPad. And even things like online shopping, physiologists know that that makes us weaker because we no longer go to the mall, walk around, carry back our items. You know, Walmart instigated about a year ago a program of uh, grocery, curbside grocery pickup. 
hugely popular, right? They just hired 20,000 more people to pack groceries and load them up for people. So just one more small example of how we've engineered this activity out of our lives. And there's no real sign of it getting better. So I just pulled this quote from the New York Times a couple months ago. If you're making the customer do any extra amount of work, no matter what industry you call home, you're now a target for disruption. Meaning that ease and convenience is now like the ultimate goal for new product development. And here's one small example that I pulled off Indiegogo. So you can turn any of your doors at home into a sliding pet door, right, with an app controlled by app. And I have a dog, I actually think this is a pretty good idea. But what struck me were the comments, the testimonials from the happy customers, like this one by Mark S. that says, <laughs> I never have to get off the couch again. Yay! Yeah, something to strive for. So what do we do with modern physical activity? Well, we compartmentalize it into these little blocks. We try and squeeze in a run before work. We go to the gym. We go to Soul Cycle and exercise with someone's sweaty butt right in front of us, like this. Yeah? And I used to go to the gym with a friend who would circle and circle the gym so that she could get out and go in and walk on the treadmill. And that always struck me as so odd. But the weird thing is, I kind of get it. Like, we have our exercise time, and then we have the rest of our life. And data suggests that if we can merge those two things, it will not only make our health better, but the planet healthier as well. So as we remove this baseline activity from our lives, fewer and fewer people are getting any activity. So here's a study looking at uh, people who reported no leisure time physical activity in 1988 and 2010. So if you kind of take the average of those blue bars, in 1988, it was about 15%. And now, in 2010, I guess a little while ago now, uh, is up to 50%. So 50% of US adults get no leisure time physical activity. And that no becomes very important. Because if you look at the data, there's a relationship between phys physical fitness and all-cause mortality. Or in this case, it's plotting survival rates. So as the curves go down, fewer people are surviving. And so here are quintiles of exercise, with quintile one being the lowest and quintile five being the highest. You can see there's a linear relationship there. That's pretty impressive, right? But I've neglected quartile number one. So if I put that on, it looks like that, right? So there's a big jump from getting those people who do no physical activity just a little bit more active up to that next quintile of activity. And here's another way to look at it. If you plot the amount of physical activity someone does versus all-cause mortality, so death by any cause, you can see that the steepest part of that curve is on the low end of physical activity, so getting people a little bit more active. And so when you go from the first dot on the vertical axis to the second and third dot, you decrease all-cause mortality by about 25%. And those two dots represent about 10 to 15 minutes of brisk walking a day. That's it. So that's a huge cut in all-cause mortality with little changes that people can make. And then the curve slopes back down. And you have that sweet spot in the middle there uh, where the recommended guidelines sit, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity. And that's a great place to be. If you're doing that already, you should keep it up because you're doing wonderful things for your health. But I'd like to point out that you, are, uh, you can't just rest on your laurels with that. Because there's also a relationship between sitting and or sedentary behavior outside of when you're exercising and physical activity. So here shows that relationship. On the horizontal axis is physical activity. On the vertical axis is sitting time. And you can see that if you sit in the middle of that line of moderate physical activity, but you're sitting the rest of the day, which we tend to do 9, 12 hours a day sometimes, um, you're negating a lot of the benefit that you're getting from physical activity. You're drifting back up into that yellow zone. And if you're not doing that outside activity and you're sitting throughout the day, you're putting yourself in the red zone. So there's a real opportunity here. And the opportunity is that the little things make a difference throughout your life. That's why I had you stand up, right? So 
taking your conference calls, standing up, you know, iPods, walking around, talking on the phone, uh, taking the stairs. If you work in a multi-floor building, use the restroom on the bottom floor and take the stairs to do that. Carry your groceries home, do a little less shopping online. So all these things can add up. I find that I spend a lot of time in my life waiting. I wait in line at Starbucks, I wait for my tea to boil in the morning, I wait for my friends to show up, I brush my teeth at night, I'm standing there, and I use those times to do a little something. You know, I'm standing on one leg, I'm using my quads, I'm stretching. If I'm home alone, I'm doing my own version of Tai Chi, which I don't really know what it is, but it feels good. Um, <laughs> and I'm not talking about standing in the Starbucks line and doing, you know, full squats, because people, <laughs> people will think you're very odd, but just a little something. And this is not going to turn me into an Olympic athlete. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that's already passed for me. But um, the data suggests that it will make me healthier if I'm consistent with it throughout the day and throughout my life. So the message of this talk is not that you need to do less. If you're already doing more, that's fantastic. But whether you're doing more or you're doing nothing at all, you should be paying attention to the little things. Your body is watching you, and you should sweat the small stuff. So my wish for you when you leave today is to re-examine your relationship with movement, to try and get movement back into your life, to treat it as an opportunity throughout your day and rejoice in those little opportunities, and to remember that a good life is not necessarily the most convenient life. Thank you.